Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And before we get started, I want to give a shout out to the Big Brother Big Sisters program. Uh, my little graduated earlier this year, albeit virtual, but they did start school here in Georgia and um, was with them for 10 years. So for any men that are out there listening to the podcast, they definitely need your expertise, and they would love it, and I think you would probably get more out of it than the the kids would. So there's a ton of women, so I'm not saying women shouldn't join Big Brother Big Sister, but I know for for my little, it was about a year and a half before we even partnered, that's just showing the the lack of male uh, presence. So... Um, with that, he's in college. I think he's going to – we set him up pretty well for the first year. But we have an author today who is the author of Sharing My Lens, The College Experience. And we're going to talk a lot about this author because she's worked globally. Um, she has a background uh, MBA and um, from business for, as an entrepreneur. She does spiritual development. She covers the gamut. And I think that you guys are really going to enjoy this podcast. So without that, I would like to welcome Juliet Nelson to the podcast. Welcome, Juliet. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Thank you for making it. And as we were talking before the podcast started, we find ourselves here in August 2020 probably busier than ever. So for those that listen to Intrinsic Motivation, as you, you probably are busy too, we don't have to watch the doom and gloom all day and think that the sky is falling because I think mm-hmm. Juliet will concur that there is a lot going on and we want to be a part of that. So, again, thanks for making the podcast. Thank you again. Yeah. And so for writing the Sharing the Lens, the college experience, if it were 2019, I would probably have a whole list of different questions. <laughs> But mm-hmm. now there are so many iterations of what school means from elementary Absolutely. to college, you know, and do we go to school virtually? Do we go to school uh, one-on-one? What's the pros and cons? If I have to go in virtually for a whole year, do I still have to pay $50,000 a year? <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So uh, did you, you, you wrote the book before 2020, though, didn't you? I did. I um, Interestingly enough, I wrote the book. Uh, it was published in November 12th of 2019, I believe, was the date. Ah, okay. Yeah. So happy early anniversary as you Thank are about you. to celebrate your <laughs> one-year anniversary. Thank you. And as they say, so much happens in a year. So what has life been, been like since the book was published? Um, if I'm being honest, I haven't had, I know you mentioned being busy, um, and I, unfortunately, I'm one of the workaholics of the world. Um, Mm -hmm. so I haven't really had the chance for it to sink in that I'm a published author. Um, Mm -hmm. and I try to look at life a little more through a simple lens as complicated of a person I can be. So for me, it's kind of like, hey, I'm the same Juliet, Um, but, you know, it it was something that, it was actually a gift to myself for my birthday, and so I I felt like I was just doing so much, and I wasn't really taking time to do something that allowed me to just release um, feelings, emotions, whatever it was, Um, and so that's how the book came out. Um, but you know, everyone's like, Oh my goodness, you're a published author. And, and I, I handled the whole, uh, publishing, uh, I, I handled the whole publishing, uh, cycle myself. Um, Mm. so yeah, I haven't really had the time to allow it to sink in. I will say, however, um, it's nice to know that it does make an impact. Um, you know, I've heard from students and adults alike of how, you know, the book has spoken to them. You know, it it is primarily catered towards students, first high school students, then college students. Um, But, you know, I've had adults who've um, 
some who chose not didn't go to college for whatever reason, whether it was a choice or they were not able to, some who long gone graduated. And for them, you know, it it allowed them to take a little, a different perspective on themselves as well about self-development, about being a learner of life's journey, right? Even if you're not necessarily sitting in a classroom, you always want to be in a posture where you're open to learning, you're open to evolving, and you're open to growing. And so um, that, that's, really what, um, that's really what it's been like since it's been published, especially in this environment. I find a lot of people coming back and referring to the book and, and giving me feedback on the book as to how it's really helped them to manage their learning and, and figure out who they are and how they learn and what they need. And I think that's very important, especially in today's climate, where um, there's just this immediate shift, but no one was ready for it. Um, and, and when you really don't have enough of an understanding of yourself and your needs, it makes it challenging to adjust. So um, overall, that's, that's really how it's been like. And, of course, being keeping busy for myself, um, we're actually uh, relaunching our publishing company as its own subsidiary, um, under my company, Junuri. Um, so it's, it's just another opportunity for writers and, 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 prom- and authors um, to share their story, their passion, and, and their purpose and their vision. So. Now, that's phenomenal. And, I mean, there was a lot wrapped up in there, which could, you know, be its own podcast. <laughs> but yeah. I, I do want to ask about, I mean, it, there's no such thing as accidents. And I love saying that there's no such thing as coincidences. And when you said that to be open to learning in 2020, that is such an understatement because Mm -hmm. from an attachment standpoint, even if you are, let's say, pedigreed, you may say, oh, well, I've done this and this and this. Well, what does that mean in 2020, right? Like it's an old Janet Jackson question, what have you done for me lately? And how hard is it to break from what you're used to doing as an attachment and being open to learning if, if it's not new. So how do you, let's just say your that muscle's atrophied, right? Like I never, uh, for the most part, uh, people that we speak with uh, on the podcast and just in real life is life is typically linear, like go to school, go to college, get the, uh, the pick a fence, the kids and all that. And then around, you know, mid-30s or beyond, then it's like, whoa, okay, what, what's going on? And then they start, start doing their life's purpose. The, now it just seems in 2020 that it's accelerated. So if you're not, if you're used to living linearly, what's some type of techniques that you can do to open yourself up to learning? I would really say take time to, um, the first learning journey is learning yourself. And I think that's why we live life linearly, because we haven't necessarily learned ourselves. And when I say learning yourself, understanding who you are, your personality, how you function, how you interact with yourself, how you interact with others, right? And what happens is as children, we're almost told how to live, right? Um, And this is generally society, right? We're told that, you know, you usually will go to school, you know, you go to school, then I know my parents are from the Caribbean. So traditional Caribbean, you go to school, you go to church, you come home, that's just the structure. And then some way, somehow, when you're done with school, you get a job, you get married, um, you have children, and then the, the cycle continues. I think when you learn yourself, you're able to discover your purpose. And so life doesn't become so linear anymore, right? Even if you are going to school and you graduate from school and you get married and you have kids and and it almost follows that path, it's not so linear because there are things that that you're doing along the way to add to that cycle of life that you're going through. Um, For myself, you know, um, I discovered my purpose a little early um, and, and people say that I'm stubborn. Um, I say that I do what I want. (laughs) So I'm able to take more responsibility for it. Um, But I chose that when I graduated from college, I chose to go to South Korea and be a teacher. Um, And honestly, it wasn't something I put much thought into. Um, I saw the opportunity. And I said, Yeah, I think I'm just going to do this. 
Um, and, and that's really how that went for me. Um, but that was also part of my choice of saying, you know what, yes, there's this path, but there are different adventures I can embrace along the way, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. in doing that, I was able to discover this, this love for life um, and, and learning about people from different cultures and backgrounds. From there, when I came back to the United States and I was working, you know, I was able to live life a a little differently. Um, I was running from being a children's choir director, which is very much part of who I am. Um, I was running from that calling, and when I came back to the States, eventually that's something that I jumped back into, but it was something I was able to do with more purpose, um, more vision, and, and really with being having a goal of, of wanting to make an impact on the kids that I worked with, not just doing it to say I did it, but knowing that they were, their lives would be impacted, um, the way they looked at the world would be impacted by how I developed a relationship with them and was truly invested in their growth and development. Um, and so, once again, my, my, my recommendation is really learning who you are, right? Understanding the introvert or the extrovert in you. Uh, understanding how you perceive the world. How are you processing the world? Don't go through life looking to serve, a, to fill a position, right, or a specific role. I always say that when, when we're kids, they always tell us, what do you want to be when you grow up? What I think we should be asking kids is, what do you want to do? Because in that way, now they're able to tap into themselves, even at their young age, and see how they can make an impact in the world. And that's where you go from living linearly to living with purpose and being able to take on these small little opportunities and go on these different adventures throughout your life and really be able to get to your 30s now and look back and say, wow, I did so much and I've grown so much, um, you know, along along my life's journey. So. Mm-hmm. I, I love it. And, and if it, uh, let me ask you, where in the country are you right now? I am currently located in Maryland in the D.C. metropolitan area. Uh, 20 minutes out from D.C. Okay. DMV, all right. And the reason why I'm asking that is in my, I finished high school in Florida. And okay. finishing high school in Florida, there, in Central Florida, there, I'm originally from New Jersey. And so in Central Florida and South Florida, there's a lot of, of tri-state people, New York, mm-hmm. uh, Connecticut, and Jersey. And then there's a lot of people from the Caribbean. And so you get this exposure to people from the islands, from Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, you see all these differences. And I'm bringing it up because I'm wondering if you're waving the flag as of this week with the VP, you know, her dad's from Jamaica, and, Mm -hmm. you know, our mom's Indian, does that give you a sense of pride? Like, look how far we've come, and how do you feel about that uh, uh, acknowledgement that happened this year? this week absolutely um i my parents are haitian so i have a haitian background but i tell you right now i love my jamaican people um i do have friends that are jamaican and and honestly i historically um jamaica had some part to play in haiti becoming the first um independent uh state in the caribbean So um, I have a deep love and appreciation for Jamaicans. So when I found out that Kamala became uh, Biden's running mate, Kamala Harris, I was extremely proud, Um, you know. And it's not even a how far we've come, right? Just how now how um, it's just nice to see that the hard work Um, of our ancestors is at least being recognized in some way, shape, or form. Um, And, you know, this is something I'm always proud of, even if I go to the the doctor. You know, I go to the doctor and I'm able to see, to have, you know, a hematologist who is Muslim. I have an allergy specialist who is Hispanic. Um, and, you know, my primary care doctor, she's Asian. And as a minority, even seeing it at that level, it makes me so proud because it's like, wow, we're able to make an impact. And even though we live in this world that's, that's to me, sometimes or oftentimes kind of corrupt, 
right, um, with the differences of opinion and so on and so forth. It's, it's just really nice to see that someone notices us. Someone notices mm. that we are able to make an impact, that we do provide value. Um, and so no matter what people's political stances are or what their percep- perceptions of Kamala Harris are, um, the fact that, you know, she's come from an Indian and Jamaican blend um, in terms of her background, it, it really represents the sacrifices of our ancestors. And it represents, you know, um, our ability to make an impact um, and, and really achieve our purposes um, in some way or another. So. Yes, I think on a grand scale overall, right, it, it's huge. And, you know, luckily for me, I'm a twin, but I have a twin sister, so you could tell the difference, right? But with some some um, twins that are identical, right? It's hard to differentiate the two. And mm-hmm. after undergrad, I, I lived in Dominican Republic, and mm-hmm. right neighbors, and it was so difficult for me to make the distinction between a Dominican and a Haitian. But they yeah. need a difference, and they're, I'm like, why you guys look like cousins? You know. Yeah. And, and, and it's really funny to see how the little uh, inner workings with different cultures. But with you having the Haitian background and living in South Korea and living in the DMV, I have family in the DMV, and mm-hmm. what you said is so common with you have people in all walks of life in these leadership roles that it's kind of common and the, the, it's normal, whereas in other parts of the country it isn't. So, with you, could you make distinctions between your upbringing with the Caribbean background versus uh, how was it to adjust in South Korea and then ultimately, you know, land back here and apply everything you've learned? Um, yeah, I I will say, so when you're living in a different country, and, and this is something I tell people, you really have to go with an open mind. Um, you have to, you can't go in this country acting like you're going to change people um, because you're, you're the foreigner now, right? Um, and so going into South Korea, I had to go in with that mentality. But I will tell you this much. There is so much that um, Caribbean culture has in, in similar to Asian culture. It's called, a, it, they're given different names. Um, and they might look differently, but there's so much we have in common. Um, I know, especially with honorifics, um, when you see an adult, especially or someone you don't know, in Asian culture, you bow, right? You slap, mm-hmm. slightly bow your head. Um, in Haitian culture, I know when you walk into a room with adults, we have to kiss every single adult on the cheek, okay? Mm-hmm. It can be 50 adults in that room, and you're walking in, and you're kissing every adult on the cheek. And I remember being a kid, I would come home, and, you know, if I just said hi to everyone and I went upstairs to my room, my parents would say, you didn't greet me. Mm-hmm. And it's because I didn't greet them with a kiss, because that's, that's how it's recognized in our culture. And then the same thing in Korean culture. The way you greet someone is not just saying hello, but bowing. Um, so I found a lot of things that were similar, and I chose to embrace those similarities. Um, some of them were even funny. I know Haitians, we love rice. No, there, there is no, um, even Jamaicans too, um, there is no, for the most part, Caribbean party or function without rice. Um, mm. And so going to Asia, Asia and living in South Korea, I'd always thought, you know, there is no one who could eat more rice than Haitian people than Caribbean people. Then I got mm-hmm. to Korea, and then the rice was breakfast, lunch, dinner, the snack, the side dish, um, everything. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you know, we really do have things in common. But the interesting thing um, was that they look at us in the West more uh, from a, a European lens. So when, mm-hmm. they, when we would have, I would have small little, you know, potlucks with my students in the beginning and the end of the term, and they would say, Miss Juliet, um, teacher Juliet, you like bread, right? You don't like rice. And I'm like, who said I don't like rice? And they're like, well, you're from the United States. You guys like bread. You don't like rice. And I had to clarify that, yes, I do love bread, but, you know, um, I come from a Caribbean culture where we eat rice 
all the time. Um, mm. So, you know, in, in funny ways like that in terms of how we eat, but also in behavior, how we value community, how we value family, how we honor, you know, our parents, our grandparents. Um, once again, they might look differently, but it's just so interesting how much we have in common. And so being able to establish, you know, a sense of community with my students, with people I'd met in Korea based on those things that we had in common, and that was a choice I made, you know, to emphasize the things I had in common. And I'll tell you, it really helped grow the relationships I was able to make. My roommate, she is Puerto Rican, um, so it was also nice to, you know, um, for us to also find the things that we had in common among our two cultures and then use those to, you know, provide a good experience to our students. So coming mm -hmm. back to the United States, um, it, it was just nice to know that I just had a little bit more culture in me. Um, now, I wasn't born and raised in South Korea, but it almost became a part of me. Um, and mm -hmm. I took that with me. And it's to the point, um, and, and I failed to mention this, but my mother's side of the family, when she was young, they all moved to St. Martin. So um, I have a lot of cousins born in St. Martin, and they speak with a heavy Caribbean accent. And that also impacts how I speak. So I came back from, from South Korea in the United States, and all of a sudden people are saying, where are you from? And I'm like, I'm from New York. And they're like, no, there, there's an accent in there. And I don't know what to put. Are you from Jamaica? Like, where are you from? And I realized it, it was just that blend of having lived in South Korea, having family from Haiti, having family from um, St. Martin, and also being surrounded by a community, um, especially from the Caribbean, um, that kind of helped make me... Basically, it, it helps shape how I present myself almost without even realizing it. Um, mm -hmm. But now in my work, I think it even helps me just to be more sensitive and more welcoming to people in spite of their background. You know, sometimes I think we see things that people do, but instead of really asking why do they do that, we're quick to attach labels to them right mm -hmm. um, and I think it causes me and I'll speak for myself just to be more sensitive um, to be open to having a conversation um, to be open to speaking about myself I know here in the United States you don't walk up to a black woman and touch their hair um, mm -hmm. in Korea that was a common thing for me where mm -hmm. people walked up to me and wanted to touch my hair they would touch my skin but I had to understand that it's, they don't see it every day, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not something common. So coming back into the United States, I also came with the mentality that if I'm going to work, whether it's with a client or just meet someone, before jumping to that conclusion of being angry, I first need to kind of check in with myself and see how were they conditioned to think. Is there space mm -hmm. for them to maybe learn a little bit about me? Um, and for me to learn about them. If they are not in the posture to receive it, at that point it makes sense to say, you know, they might be insensitive or they might be taking a stance of ignorance if that's what they choose to do. But before me reaching that conclusion, I allow myself the space to say, okay, which, where are they coming from in terms of their environment and how is that conditioning their behavior? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, there, wow, there's so much to unpack from that. Um, one of which is, how did you get to South Korea? How did the opportunity present itself? And then uh, the, the little backside to that is, in undergrad, I had an opportunity to sign up with the Peace Corps. And it's like nine months for the whole uh, application process, you know, the psyche vow and all these other stuff. And so one thing that I had to check myself was that I, I, in college I was a vegetarian <laughs> and they were like mm -hmm. we were going to Ghana so they were like if you go to Ghana like if they don't have you're not in the in the urban area so you're out remotely and they're like you better eat whatever they bring you you know it's like it, you, they're offended if you don't do that and then mm -hmm. they would tell like some of my well, white counterparts that 
they will run away from them just because they hadn't seen, you know, a person of that hue before, right? Mm-hmm. So every place is different. And I, I wanted to know what was the opportunity that led you to go into South Korea? Um, so I am Seventh-day Adventist. I went to a youth conference um, for young people, um, and they were they had, like, this exhibition of, um, different Seventh-day Adventist organizations and agencies around the world, um, just, you know, promoting their services or, or getting volunteers to sign up. So I went to that youth conference, and I'm walking around the exhibition, and I stumbled upon some youth um, English institute from South Korea, and they said they were looking for English teachers. I think I was maybe in my second to last year of college, I believe, of undergrad, and I said, well, I'm not an education major, but I'll definitely pass the information along to any friends that might be interested. And they said, no, all you have to have is a bachelor's degree. Um, And I said, okay. So I signed up for the opportunity. I interviewed for it. Um, And, you know, the rest is history. Now, as some context, my father is a history teacher. And as a kid, I, my, one of my first dreams was to be a teacher. Um, it's a very trivial reason, so you can judge me if you want. But in the sixth grade, uh, we had they have like Superintendent's Day, where the kids get a day off from school, but the teachers actually have to come in for you know professional development. Um, I didn't know that. I thought everybody was off. So we come back from our day off, and you know everyone's like, "How was your day off?" and so on and so forth. And the teacher said, "I don't get a day off. That's a day off for you guys." And I was mortified. I said, absolutely not. And I, and I literally threw the whole dream away. Um, <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm not about to have my students taking one, one day off out of the whole entire year of, and, and all the days off that we already get. Um, I'm not going to have them staying home and I have to come to work. That's not fair. Um, and so I put my foot down and I said, I don't want to be a teacher anymore. <laughs> um, but that was actually part of my purpose. I just I didn't know how it would reveal itself, right? So Mm -hmm. going to South Korea, I I really didn't even realize what I was doing until my plane was flying over Japan. And Mm -hmm. I realized, like, it couldn't go back. Um, Like, this Mm -hmm. is it, you're in Korea for a year. Um, Mm -hmm. So basically, yeah, that's that's kind of how that happened. Um, Mm -hmm. and, And, you know, the rest is history. But I will say that's really where I just, discovered that skill for teaching and not not only discovered it, but also embraced it. I kind of accepted that, yeah, Juliet, you are an educator. You do teach. You might not do it in a classroom setting, but you do it as a choir director. You do it in training and development. You do it as part of your company. Um, so that's kind of, that, that set as the precedent for me discovering that skill. Um, and I think that's also why, part of why I said, hey, it doesn't hurt to try it, because I knew at some point in my life I wanted to be a teacher. So I'm like, it's one year, it doesn't hurt to try. Um, and, and it's something that's really impacted my life in the long run. So, Absolutely. And one of the biggest channels, at least to my knowledge on YouTube, is the study, of, not study abroad, but living abroad. Um, they mm-hmm. have these uh, blacks or Caribbeans in Korea, yeah. Japan, all over Asia. And earlier this week, there was an article in the, in the Wall Street Journal about uh, black black expats. Where mm-hmm. like some my one of my sisters, she worked at GE for years in Germany, mm-hmm. and they and, and in the article they were just saying how they kind of let their hair down and it was just a different life uh, without mm-hmm. worrying about things here in the states. So mm-hmm. I, I wanted to know, have you ever thought about, since you got your feet wet, of going back and living in South Korea or going back to Asia? Um, I've considered visiting. I, I decided I wouldn't want to go back and work there. Now, um, I would love to work abroad. I would love to travel as part of my work. Um, I will say that there are cultural differences. Um, and you, you've got to be very well aware of that. It doesn't make them bad. It just makes them different. And so with that, I kind of said I'm okay <laughs> with how the work culture is in the United States while still honoring how it is in Asia. 
um, or in South Korea. Um, with that being said, I would be open to maybe going to work in South Korea or in any other country on behalf of a of a company from the United States. Because in that sense, I still feel that um, there's some level of coverage I get um, from, you know, headquarters in the States. Um, but it still allows me the chance to adjust to another culture and, and build good relationships with people in that other culture. So that's, that's my perspective. Um, but, you know, I, I think I would probably even more prefer to just have that life of travel where I'm able to travel to Asia for a couple of weeks and, and or wherever, Asia, Europe, Africa, um, any country in those continents and, you know, meet new clients, meet business partners, and, and, and collaborate in some form or another. I think that's more of what I envision for my life. Um, whether that will happen or not, I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> but that's probably <laughs> what I would prefer. Yeah. Sure. I mean, and, it, and it's definitely doable, especially 2020. Uh, if I look at the pandemic, uh, Elon Musk said, I'm going to keep my business open because overseas in Asia, no one's getting sick, right? And yep. so uh, we know that some Silicon company, Silicon Valley companies do have uh, locations throughout Africa just because the cost mm -hmm. of living is so inexpensive. So mm -hmm. we are living in a flat world, and it sounds like that you're positioning yourself to be a part of that. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I did want to ask you about, um, let's just say, uh, since we're, we weren't around, let's say in the 1960s or the 50s when you traveled overseas, you had a quote-unquote black experience. And in 2020, you know, everyone's getting, in, they're taking their ancestry test and learning more about their history so they can say, hey, I'm Haitian American or, you know, um, like Kamala, Jamaican uh, descent what have you, and you said in Korea that they kind of looked at you from a Western standpoint. Did you, do you see yourself or do you see today more of a clarification of, no, this isn't the, I'm not a, a American, if you will, or uh, in my experience, I, whenever I leave, I, before I used to say African Americans, and then the Africans, they kind of said, no, you're a black American. And I was just wondering, being from the Caribbean, what was it like as far as, was it an education or did you kind of pick your battles as to establishing your full identity overseas? Um, it's more education. First it's understanding and then it's, it's education. Um, and also you have to keep in mind that how English is used across different cultures is very different, right? So in Korea, their use of English is first influenced with influenced by how they use Korean, right? And mm. so if someone calls you a black person um, or even a Negro, right, um, in a different country, it might just come from the fact that in their native tongue, that's what it's called, right? Um, so the first thing I had to do is first try to understand what their perspective was and where they were coming from. Because you can't really clarify anything or educate if you don't know what the person knows and maybe what they might need to, what needs to be clarified. Um, and then from there, um, I would just say, you know, my family is from Haiti and a lot of them don't know what Haiti is or where Haiti is. Um, when I mentioned the earthquake um, that hit Haiti um, about 10 years ago, that clarified it for a lot of them because that was something that was just international. Um, but a lot of them didn't know what Haiti was. Um, and so it's just a little bit of education saying, you know, my parents were born in Haiti. Um, and also, once again, with the Western perspective, I think they, for them, that European, um, it's more of the European influence on the culture. And so that's what's portrayed. And so that's what they might assume. Now, that doesn't say that they, they don't know much about black culture because, you know, with the dance, song, and all of that, a lot of that is influenced by um, black culture, African culture. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of our behaviors, how we live our day-to-day, -day, for them, the assumption is very European. 
So it was just, it, it was often just a teachable moment and saying, you know, my parents are from Haiti um, and, and these are, and, and we have a lot in common than you might think. And instead of separating myself from the European culture, my goal was more to connect myself more to their culture in mm-hmm. saying, as a Haitian American, as a Caribbean American, this is what we have in common. We have a lot of respect for adults. The way you greet adults here is different in Haiti, but, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on how you greet people, how you speak to people, how you interact around people, um, you know, your community, your family, that, that collective culture, it exists mm-hmm. in Haiti. Um, you know, when you leave your parents' home, you don't forget your community. You come back and you serve. Um, or you come back and you do something that will impact the community, and, and it's very similar in Asia. Um, so that that was really much my approach, you know, not really trying to um, debunk or crush their thoughts, but, you know, bring some understanding and then say we have a lot more in common than we, we don't. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely, and that kind of takes me back. I know you already answered, but in korea and as you mentioned in haiti and and the, and the caribbean uh there is that that uh, acknowledgement of your of your elders and mm-hmm. more so than the states and so do you feel again that's probably another way of approaching the same question do you see that uh growing in your later years that it would be easier uh, to move back to either uh, the caribbean or asia um, not necessarily. I think it's, um, I guess my choice is trying to connect with people here and, and building those relationships, but also finding under, finding a way to build understanding among people here. Um, mm-hmm. Now, do I want to impact, um, find a way to impact um, my community in Haiti? Um, and, and even home in Korea, because that's the second home at this point. Absolutely. You know, I still keep in touch with my students. I keep in touch with my Korean and my Chinese teacher that I met in Korea. Um, I even have an adopted Korean mother. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I do have, I'm, I'm very well, my intentions um, are to give back and to, in some way or shape or form, to give back to Haiti, and that's something I've always been doing. Um, and and whether it's you know working and and pouring into Haitian children here, and you know helping them discover their purposes and helping them see how they can make an impact in the world, um, or you know finding ways to either donate or to um, support organizations that do serve in Haiti. Whatever it is, that's, that's more my intention, but to actually go and live there, not so much. <laughs> sure. And, and we've learned that we can do it all virtually no matter where you are in the world. So yeah. there's that. Um, I did want to ask you another just cultural question. You said that if you go into a room and, you know, it's, a, it's an offense if you don't kiss everyone on the cheek, and they had something like that that was similar in Korea. And I did know over just my experience dealing with people overseas, their personal space is so much closer than it is in the States. You're like, get off me, <laughs> you know. And so yeah. I wanted to ask you about your take on from a global perspective of how we are handling the current crisis versus what's happening in South Korea and other places. And you're talking the current crisis as of COVID. Yeah. Um. Hmm. Honestly, I, I think so. The United States is. I what do they call it? A melting pot. Yeah. Um. And I realize with that melting pot comes uh, common sense. A lack of common sense. Um, and and a great lack of unity. It's significant division in the United States. And I think in countries that have come out of this pandemic um, or at least have been able to go 
closely back to normal day life, I think it shows the difference between um, what happens when you have a unified culture and what happens when you have so much division. Mm. Um, And I don't mean to get too political, but you have the leader of this country, someone who's supposed to really drive a vision um, and represent the people and do everything in the best interest of the people who doesn't appear to be on a united front with his experts, right? People who are supposed to be advising him. You have some who say, oh, it's not a big deal. You have others who say, no, this is serious. And so based on that, he chooses whatever narrative he wants to share. Um, and so depending on how you're impacted on by COVID, um, you're either going to take precautions or you're not. And I think that's what's going on in this country. Whereas outside of the United States, it appears that there's a little bit more unity um, because once again, it's for the most part one culture. There might be other cultures that exist within the one culture, but um, it seems that there's a little bit more togetherness. Um, You know, in South Korea, to see how they were able to jump in action and and make sure that people got tested and and even in china um to see how they also jumped in action they had protocol um in place to check temperatures to track who has this and who has that you see that everybody was on one united front right um and it's very different where you have so many people with so many different opinions and so many different perspectives and some people who care and some people who don't care Um, And then you have to also think of the fact that um, outside of China, a lot of these countries are more small. They're very, very small. Um, Mm -hmm. So the influence might be a little more significant than the United States, where not only are we large, we have 50 states. And in those 50 states, we have, you know, different cultures that exist within those states. And then and there's division, you know, there's division within towns, division within states. It's it's just a lot. So it makes it challenging to really get everybody on a united front. I will say it makes me sad to see because we're supposed to be, you know, the leader of the free world and we're supposed to be the one that drives the world economy. And I don't I don't know how much of a great job we're doing that based on how we're just failing to handle a pandemic. So do you feel that um, I use one of my sister, uh, two sisters, uh, that were mm-hmm. expats? My twin sister still is in in Spain, but yes. one thing um, that I remember my middle sister at the time that was living in Germany uh, after 2001, they said, "Oh, now you guys know what it feels like." Meaning, uh, other places around the world, they they've had those you know unfortunate events happen. And mm-hmm. since then, you know, we've thwarted so many attacks that wouldn't even be on the news, right, unless somebody brought mm-hmm. it up. But uh, it was that one major thing that made us change. And with Korea and some of these others, they've had something similar, not on a, on a global scale. Mm-hmm. So and the closest thing we had is over 100 years ago. So it doesn't look like it's going away anytime soon. There may be iterations and permutations. But do you think mm-hmm. that would be better after? I mean, we're, we're floundering because we don't really have a benchmark to pull from, and 100 years ago was too far for, you know, for recollection. That could be the case. Um, I, I also feel like, honestly, I think the United States, we, we have almost this feeling of superiority Mm-hmm. Um, where a lot of us are not in touch with the reality of America. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And it's not to sound too political, um, and it's not to bash anybody. Um, you know, going to South Korea, I'll say, I didn't know what to express when I moved there. But I had a lot of people ask me, like, where are you sleeping? Are you sleeping in a tent? Are you sleeping in a hut? And I'm mm-hmm. like, no, I live on the 14th <laughs> floor with floors that warm up. Um, you know, yeah, I sleep on the floor, but that's because the floors heat up. Um, and you know, I, I put in a code to get into my apartment, but you know, I think in the United States, we're so siloed where we think that, you know, we have this feeling of superiority where the, the leader of the free world and we have the best economy and we have the best this and we have the best that. And so it blinds us to 
the ability that um, a pandemic or an epidemic is inevitable. You know, it, we, we are not immune to it. Um, and I think because of that, it, it, it up impacts the way we're able to receive reality, right? I mean, look at mm-hmm. something as simple as racism. We struggle to accept that that's a thing, right? Under the previous president, President Obama, of course, he was black. So what did a lot of people say? Oh, well, our, we have a black president. There can't possibly be racism. And now mm-hmm. under this current president, we're still struggling to accept that reality when it's literally, it's on camera now, right? It's, as, mm-hmm. it's very plain and it's very obvious. And so in the case of a pandemic, you know, um, you have people who are like, no, it's, it's in Asia or we pin it, right? We call it the Chinese virus. And it's like, no, 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 this is something that's impacting people all over the world. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, how that virus came about, different conversation, different day. But, you know, um, we, we like, we would rather point fingers, we would rather separate ourselves instead of saying, you know what, we really need to take precautions and be part of the solution, even if we're not directly impacted. Because the reality is everybody comes to the United States from all over the world. And, you know, I found it interesting that in the beginning of the pandemic, we were closing our doors to every country. And I recently saw a map of countries that are allowing Americans in there, within their borders. And they were like dots on a map. And mm-hmm. granted, I'm living in the United States, but as a Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean American, it made me happy. I'm like, look at how the tables have turned, right? Mm-hmm. Well, we're sitting on, we try to put ourselves on this pedestal where we really don't want to be open um, to what, what else is going around the world and, and really be sensitive to it and say, if something impacts a country around the world, that impacts us as well because we make up every country around the world. But now it's like we didn't, we didn't learn. So now we're all boxed in and having to deal with this problem. And other countries have, you know, progressed. You have they've come out of it, New Zealand, um, countries in Asia, countries in Europe. And now, you know, we're siloed because if we travel there, we bring that virus with us and they don't need that type of negative energy anymore. So I think it's more us changing our, our mindset and really realizing and accepting that we are not immune to anything that happens around the world. And a, a problem in our global community is also our problem. Let me, and please help me with the pronunciation with this. Is it Janori? Junuri, yeah. Janori. Okay, so I want you to talk a little bit about that. And I know we weren't talking about politics, but with uh, the current, uh, the, the, the opponent of, like, the Democrat, of, of the Republican Party, they signed in the 90s the prison, the, the prison pipeline. And so I want to talk about Januri, and is that a possible pipeline that you're doing to educate people to travel and learn and become more worldly? Um, um, and not necessarily. Uh, Januri is actually formed a few years ago. Um, it is a learning and development platform, mm-hmm. um, and our mission is basically to um, empower people to achieve the highest standard of their purpose and that's through learning and growth whether it's learning as learning and growth as a student um, as a professional um, and and that's really what what our goal is now to encourage them to travel if that is um, a goal or if that's something that piques their interest we would coach them through the process of you know what are the things that you might encounter um, and also coaching them through the self-development process, through the learning process of understanding how they can manage themselves and how they can stay true to themselves while adjusting in a foreign environment. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so if that was a goal of one of our students and professionals, we actually did have a professional that um, landed a job in Iran. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, she came to us with a resume. We did her resume and she was able to get her dream job and she's doing, she's, doing her thing so it really depends on their goal yeah yeah because i'm imagining and i'm I'm a little older i think i'm older than you but 
I remember in uh, I went to Clark Atlanta, and so in the AUC, the in undergrad we were kind of in the business school. We were taught to go to the street for two years, which was you know Wall Street, and then they would partner with the HBCUs to go to Ivy Leagues. So a lot of people went to HBCUs undergrad, and they had Ivy MBAs or you know uh, graduate degrees. And so that was in the 90s. And now when I speak with the students, you know, they're not even going to the street anymore. They're going to internships in China and, and other places around the world. So they're kind of known or taught or continuing to know about the global marketplace. So I, I wanted to know if with, with you and, and your outfit, are you partnering with local community? I mean, there's a, there's a cluster of HBCUs in the DMV. Do you partner with any of them to uh, as a, a kind of a pipeline? Like you said, there's uh, not the traditional students. You have adults going back to school. Um, but what about the high school kids and the college students? Do, would they work with you to learn more and, and be more worldly? Um, so it depends, right? Um, you know, a lot of the students come, a lot of parents come and they bring their children, and I'm talking from elementary to high school, it's kind of different for um, even for my high school and my college and um, higher education clients. But for let's talk the, the elementary to early high school students, um, their parents usually come with a skill that their child needs to develop. So whether it's math, English, or whatever the case may be. My company, what we do, um, and especially as myself, um, as one of the the tutors slash educators on the team, we really assess their needs um, and we, we create a personalized learning plan for them. And so, for example, oftentimes I get, well, my child is having trouble with math problems. And so you look at their work and I say, wait, let, let, me, take, let me take a look at your, your writing and let me take a look at your English and let me take a look at um, your reading comprehension. And then I find out some of them just don't even know how to read the words. And so, therefore, they don't know what they're being asked. Some of, for some of them, it's a reading or a writing or a comprehension problem. So it goes beyond the math word problem. So we're able to create a learning plan for them to really build on all their skills and have those come together holistically. Um, what we also do with the students is work with them in, in, in understanding their purpose. So one of the big, big projects I've done with my students this summer is um, actually helping them understand their learning style um, and also doing personality assessments for some of them. Uh, my big go-to is Myers-Briggs because um, mm -hmm. that's just my favorite. And, you know, mm -hmm. they'll find out they're introverted, they're extroverted, um, they're more intuitive, they're more sensory, um, some more organized, some more go with the flow. But what I've done is, is worked with them in, in really having these conversations of, how do you think you can make an impact in the world, and how would you like to make an impact in the world? Um, and some of them will come back and say, I want to be a this, and I want to be a that. And I say, don't tell me what you want to be. Tell me what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. with that, that is where we're able to identify, okay, maybe there are opportunities for the travel, or maybe there are opportunities for um, just engaging with people of different cultures here um, in the States. So, yeah, it's, it's more about having them tap into their interests, their skills, um, and their, their vision, even though they're young, and then seeing what would work um, in that sense. Now, what we are also doing is working on how we can um, develop, and, and that should be ready by the fall, but develop a, a directory of um, – other organizations, um, after-school programs, uh, daycares, whatever it is that serves students and professionals so that Junuri is not just the source, the only source of um, education, learning, and development, but they can also tap into, they can also have access to other resources that they can tap into um, for their learning and development experience. There was an article this week, and they were talking about the different uh, responses, like you said, <laughs> every state is responding to the coronavirus differently, and they were highlighting those in Silicon Valley and such, and the private jets and the private, you know, 
still jet setting like it's still 2019. They're they're unbothered. And one thing that in the article they highlighted was that some of the teachers were being, you know, teachers don't want to go back to school. And here in the South, I think they started school already, so like a week or so ago. But mm-hmm. they don't want to, you know, they don't have, uh, they don't want to bring it back to their families and such. So they're being lured away by wealthier people. And when with, I wanted to get your experience, because I, I have to thank you, with Junery, it sounds like, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, that there is a chasm even in, in individual states of the haves and have-nots, and, if, and by extension, the have and have-not for education. So when mm-hmm. you said the reading comprehension and such, is that overwhelmingly an economic issue? And if it is, then I, I think I have to thank you even more so by having Junery out. Uh, so you're asking me if it's an economic issue, you said? Yeah, are you seeing, like, are you seeing for your people that are coming in, there's some that uh-huh. acknowledge for the parents that we want tutors and what have you, which yeah. across all lines. But if you see an overwhelming amount of students, you're like, okay, where are you from? Where where do you live? What's the day like? Are yeah. you Is that an economic issue that you're seeing of, your, of um, the people you're dealing with? Not not necessarily. I think it's maybe the approach of the learning experience they're getting it, and we we so we have to understand as well. Um, and and I'll put this out there: teachers are awesome. They have a very challenging job. I think they're required more than to do. They're required to do more than they're paid. Um, but I just want to put that out there. Shout out to all teachers and educators. Shout out to all teachers and educators. <laughs> but I did a year. Know, um, but he, here's the challenge. You have a lot of, in some of these public schools especially, mm-hmm. it's one mm-hmm. teacher for like 25, 30 students. Mm-hmm. And so it really, de- it's almost the survival of the fittest, right? Mm-hmm. It, it depends on what which kid can get it the quickest and which, and some kids don't always catch on as quickly. That's just the reality. Um, mm-hmm. And that's not always something that the teacher has control over because they're, they have a curriculum that they're supposed to follow, right? Um, mm-hmm. There are things that they, they have to teach the students. Um, and so for some students, if it's not at their pace, unless, you know, it's a learning disability where there are opportunities for them to, to have someone sit with them in the class, oftentimes they, they fall behind. And mm-hmm. so that's where you might see some of their skills shine more than others, right, where a kid, if they're able to catch on in math and and they're able to, you know, do the homework independently and so on and so forth um, within that large classroom setting, sure, but they might not be able to catch on as quickly in language art. Um, Mm -hmm. And so what happens is when one part fails, it becomes like almost a domino effect where Mm -hmm. they can excel, um, but but it's challenging because of some of the things that they're not able to really catch up on. So I think that's really what it is. It can be economic. It can be. Um, And I will acknowledge that in many instances it is. For the students that I have gotten, that was not always the case. But that doesn't change the fact that it can very much be economic, where the school that they're going to doesn't have the resources um, Mm. to really invest in you know, all of those different skill sets. Um, I find that, you know, for, and in my experience, some schools, you know, they're more advanced, but they don't necessarily break up the kids based on their skill set. So you have a student who's maybe at their grade level and they're doing okay or they're slightly below, but they're struggling to catch up because the school they're in is teaching them at, a grade level higher than they are because they're trying to, you know, push the kids to excel. And so that mm-hmm. makes it even challenging for the student to adjust. Um, mm-hmm. But once again, from my experience, it hasn't been um, significantly impacted by, you know, socioeconomic status. Uh, however, I do very much acknowledge that that does exist. Sure. And, and, I, and for the record, I did do one year – and it was one of my favorite years of my whole life. I taught second grade. It was awesome. Mm-hmm. And I remember at the time before getting the job, some of the graduating class, they were looking at, quote, unquote, combat pay. And so, you know, the the big, the more urban the area, the more money they would get, right? But they didn't have the resources. 
And not to throw LeBron under the bus, but like for athletes, if they show that promise and they're in, in those type of environments, they get moved out. They get moved out mm-hmm. to go to the schools in the north and you get to identify strengths, weaknesses, so they become that best person from a mm-hmm. from a athletic standpoint. And mm-hmm. the parallel I even see even with the pandemic is uh, people have access, like what kind of access do you have? And mm-hmm. those with access are getting better treatment. So, again, I, I think that even outside of the social economic issue, I think having a resource such as Junery is is Absolutely. huge. So, mm-hmm. yeah, thank, thank you for that for sure. Um, so you have Junery. You, you're a published ar- uh, author now. How are – and we talked a little bit about this earlier at the beginning of <laughs> you haven't let it sink in. And, mm-hmm. and part of the early uh, research now also is that with people working home, they're working longer hours than they did in the office. So mm-hmm. how are you able to find the balance between your professional, academic, and personal life? It is, it, I will say now it is very challenging, and I, I'm going to speak for today. Um, and today we are, what, August 19th, August 19th, 2020. Um, I, I'm and you're so to... ahead of us. You're three days ahead of us. Did you know that? August 16th. See that? Um, I can't <laughs> so we are on August 16th. I could have sworn it was the 19th, but it's not the 19th, everyone. It is the 16th. <laughs> um, and I clearly need more sleep. Um, so I, I've been managing, I will say, uh, with the pandemic, I've been managing. Um, and it, it, if it happened in another time, I think I would have more challenges adjusting. Um, However, you know, I am managing my reality, however, is that, um, and this is partly my fault, I've been putting in at least 15, sometimes 20-hour days. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, when the pandemic happened, when it transferred into the state and, um, and, you know, I found out I'd be working from home, I, I low key I wasn't excited about the pandemic. I was excited about the work from home. Right. Because <laughs> sure. I'm more introverted. I didn't have to put pay for gas all the time. Um I didn't have to pay for gas all the time. What else? I you know, I I, I got to stay in the, the dry cleaning part of my home. I am doing my PhD at the same time. Um wow. and so I got excited and I can't make this up. I took on my last three courses of my academic journey, um, you know, before I transition into my dissertation. And I took three of them in one quarter. That is three times the workload for a PhD student. In addition to having to navigate all of these students of mine who've now transferred into the virtual space, and a lot of them who are now, who, you know, only call me on per DM when they have a special project, but they're now needing constant attention because they're like, Ms. Juliet, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm having trouble. I need motivation. I'm not motivated. I need this. I need that. Um, in addition to, of course, working from home full time, in addition to just navigating the impact of the pandemic, right? Um, mm. So I had days where it was okay. Other days, I, I really was like, Juliet, what are you doing? three courses in one quarter during a pandemic any other time of the year but now. Um, I'll have to say I did survive it, um, but now, you know, as myself and my team were working on growing the business, it's it's a different dynamic of 15-hour days. I am now in, you know, fully working on my dissertation, um, so the experience is different. Um you know, I I ended up having to switch out my glasses. Um, mm-hmm. I am so embarrassed to say this, but I hadn't gotten my eyes checked since after I'd come from South Korea. So that's about six years ago. Wow. And I was walking around with glasses that I'd gotten from South Korea. And I love glasses. I have about 15 to 20 pairs. But sitting in front of the computer was very challenging. So I, I went and I got my eyes checked because my eyes were burning. You know, it, it was very, very hard to get through these 15-hour mm-hmm. days. Um, mm-hmm. And I went and got myself blue light blockers. Um, mm-hmm. But I got in trouble by my doctor because he's like, you, you're, you're not allowed to walk around with these glasses. You're walking around blind. 
Um, mm-hmm. So I, I'm <laughs> now in the space of just trying to find ways that will um, help me adjust. You know, I did switch, change my eating habits, um, and I'm trying to be very intentional about self-care, even though I am working a lot, a lot. But my next step is, you know, trying to get more sleep and having a schedule where I am able to sleep. I'm making sure that I'm eating, you know, three meals a day at least, so that I at least have the energy to perform at the levels that I want to. You may or may not have this already, but uh, I be remiss if I didn't tell you about the iSaver software. And there's so many different iterations. You could just do a Google search, and they're usually free. But they give you the notification after, like, 40 minutes. The screen will go dark. They'll remind you to do the exercises. And I'm one of those people that thought, for my water example, oh, yeah, I drink enough water. But when I, had, when I downloaded the water app, I realized how dehydrated I was. Yeah. So, you know, technology in a lot of respects is our friend. So if you don't have that eye saver, you might want to download that. Just as a I reminder am, to get I am up. writing that down as we speak. Yeah. Yeah, the blue light blockers for sure. But it's just a reminder because I know I'm I'm one of those people too, if I don't watch it. You're like, No, I got I gotta I gotta get this done, right? There's always you're never gonna get it done, right? There's always something and, and else to do. That's me. Yeah. My team is actually the one that messages me and emails me and texts me at two AM and they're like, You need to go to sleep. We're done. You're done. Shut it down. Yeah. You're, done. <laughs> <laughs> you're done. Time for bed. We're going to bed now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I get – I have an awesome team. Shout out to Team Junuri. Um, You know, they – I have some of them that reach out, um, and I'm like, hey, we got this project. I got this opportunity. We have this. And the, they won't even answer. They're like, so did you eat today? Mm-hmm. Um, um, and sometimes – guys, don't try this at home. But sometimes – and I know them, some of them personally. So I, um, I'll use it against them sometimes where they call and they're like, did you eat today? And I say, I won't eat until this project is done. And if they have any, ah. they'll get it done. <laughs> so, um, but no, I do, I do have an awesome team, you know, um, you know, they do, it's nice to have people on your team who see your vision and see your purpose and, and they're, they, they're invested in that as well. Um, Absolutely. so they do hold me accountable. They do reach out and they're like, you need to go to bed. Um, you need to eat, and so on and so forth. So, Sure. The type A me recognizes and salutes the type A in you, so it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> and since you are making strides to balance it out, um, you will be healthy enough to talk about your book and actually uh, take a deep breath to let some of that sink in so that people can find out, because I'm sure they want to continue to reach out to you once they find the book. But how would they find the book? And also, I want you to plug the Junery so people can get in touch with you that way as well. Absolutely. Well, um, you can find uh, my book, Sharing My Lens, The College Experience, on Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, Kobo Books. It's also on Apple Books. Um, We are um, relaunching our publishing company, Junery Publishing, um, actually the subsidiary. That is going to be launched um, sometime in the fall, so look out for that, and I will be publishing the second edition of Sharing My Lens, The College Experience. Um, You can also look out for an audio book in the fall. Um, Visit us on Instagram and Facebook at junuri.co. Um, you can also find us on Twitter, Junory underscore co. We are also on LinkedIn. Um, my Instagram um, and Facebook is official Juliet Nuri Nelson. And Nuri is spelled N as in Nancy, U-R-I, Juliet spelled J-U-L-I-E-T-T-E, official Juliet Nuri Nelson. Um, we do have, um, and I think this is the first time I'm saying this on a podcast, so cheers to your podcast. Um, but we are actually coming out with an eyewear collection in the fall as well. Um, And that's going to be um, primarily targeted to our students and professionals, and these will be, they will be um, with premium blue light blocking lenses. Um, Mm -hmm. So whether you have a prescription and you're as blind as a bat like I am, or if you just want to wear them for fashion, um, they're open for everyone. Um, so you guys can also look out for that um, in the fall. No, that, that's, that's phenomenal. It sounds like a lot on the plate, and it sounds like a lot yeah. that's coming. 
So, you know, we're super excited. We want to stay in touch with you as you continue following your journey and, and filling, fulfilling your purpose. So with that, you have just been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza and Juliet Nelson. It was a pleasure. Get some rest and let's stay in touch. Absolutely. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.